Are you ready? Are you ready? Ready. 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 Hold your nose steady. Hold your nose steady. Hold your nose steady and breathe from deep down in your heels. You know what you want. You've known it for a time now. It isn't that crazy pipe dream in the sky? Pipe dream in the sky. Pipe dream in the sky. Coming home. Coming home. That's what you want. Coming home is what you wanted all the while. Back, back, back to this place where you've always been free. Back to this place where you can't fail to see everybody and everything. Everybody and everything is one. 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 Everybody and everything. Everybody and everything is one. Everybody and everything, everybody and everything is one. 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 Hello. It's nice to be here with you. Welcome to the Satsang. If you've been to the Satsang before, um, you'll know the score. If you've not been before, what basically happens is, is I'm going to warm to the theme, which this week is the um, instigation of an upswell of inbound money flow into your coppers as if by sheer magic. And uh, to also, and probably more importantly, because money is only money and flows only flow, to reduce the levels of stress that you may be feeling that you're mind is attached to financial stress or whatever um, because you know, uh, 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 over stressing yourself prevents enjoying being alive no matter where the drama is going from moment to moment. So really the subtext of this is let's all relax a little bit more and trust in what we might have called divine providence in the old days. So the idea that the Tao which is the Chinese version of the ineffable presence that informs our reality at the subatomic level forever and ever and ever, who goodness knows why or how, um, is a mirror to whatever you believe it will be. That's the, 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 the most you can actually say in terms of absolute truth. And if you believe, therefore, that the Tao, this unseen, invisible, ineffable presence, um, will provide for you and then it will. That's how it works. So the, the fairy tale works by you believing it's a fairy tale. And the fairy godmother um, is there because you believe the fairy godmother is there. It's a hard thing to accept because it means you have to take responsibility for your entire reality rather than um, give authority to some higher power. You are that higher power. We are all that higher power. We don't know it most of the time because we're lost in the trance of being a kind of an individuated, localized being. Uh, but the idea that everybody and everything is one, it doesn't mean that we're walking around in one body, because that would be really, really uncomfortable. Can you imagine going to the toilet, for example? But the, the fact that at the subatomic level, there is just one presence here, and it expresses itself through many, many, many different faces. Yours, mine, everybody's here, everybody in the world, and throughout the universe, throughout time and space. And um, the, um, the, the power to ordain a change in the warp and weft of manifest reality, the result of the, the motion, if you like, of the Tao, um, lies within each of us. And when we come together in, um, in a group, as, as long as there's more than two of us together, as the old saying goes, um, the, the power of us ordaining something grows exponentially for everybody present. The ancient Taoists um, had various techniques which passed down through various lineages, one of which was um, uh, used to adhere to what they called the violet ray, which was said to be a technique inherited from beings who arrived here from the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, which are about 160 light years away, no, no, sorry, about 500,000 light years away. So not very far, they're, they're quite close. Um, and they came with many techniques and aspects of the incredible Taoist practice. Whether this is true or not doesn't matter, it's a nice story. And um, one of which was the violet ray, which is used, the visualization of the violet ray is used to instigate a quantum change rather than an incremental one. 
And when we talk about finance, oh yeah, what I was saying was what's going to happen. So this is me warming to the theme. I'll do this for a few minutes. I'll try and cut it short because I do tend to go on a bit. Some people's accusing me of waffle. Even I reckon if it is waffle, you don't get much more succinct and profound cosmologically orientated waffle than this, nonetheless. Um, and then I will move into a guide for meditation, which is extemporized, improvised and responding to what I'm perceiving as the energy amongst us and informing us simultaneously. I go into a trance when I do that, um, as in I'm right in it with you, got my eyes closed, and am focusing in the same way that I'm feeling you focusing. It's a sort of psychic transmission, um, receiving and, and, and transmitting simultaneously. And people who, who have been before and who come regularly often tell me they really, really feel this connection, which is gratifying to know, because I do too. And it's um, reassuring occasionally for me, being human, um, to know that it's not just me imagining it all. Although on some level, of course, it is for all of us. We're all just imagining all of this. And one of the aspects of Taoist wisdom says that it's each of us ascribe um, to whatever we're experiencing, all the meaning it has. This is exactly similar to uh, what it says in the Course in Miracles. Um, you know, I have given this phenomenon all the meaning it has for me. Um, so this is a sort of a, a pretty standard metaphysical uh, preset. And it, 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 this is what I was saying before about the Tao being, or serving, or acting like a mirror to whatever you believe it will be. Um, so this stops the doubt being some big daddy in the sky with a beard, a big authority figure, or a big woman in the sky. Which, by the way, my theory on that, where that derives, that um, belief in there being a man in the sky with a beard, is from when you were two years old, um, and you know, bearing in mind that the man in the sky with a beard comes out of the Middle East uh, tradition, um, where guys probably did all have beards, because I don't think they had Gillette around in those days. And if you're a little kid looking up at your daddy, who in those days being a patriarchal kind of world would have controlled everything for you. You would look at him and see a man in the sky with the bibs, he was way out there. When the women were in control, I would imagine that you'd looked up and seen a woman in the sky, and that's when the goddess was the was the was in vogue. But that's by the by for now. Um, we we then after the uh, the guide of meditation, there'll be time for providing I don't go on too long because I can't tell I've got my eyes closed as I say. Um, there'll be time for questions and answers. I will do my best to make time for that because I personally find that the most enjoyable part. I love to hear from you. Well, the way that's done is you either type in a, a thing into the, the typing inbox, which you see somewhere on the right probably, well, that's at least where I got it. Um, the, Sue will see those and read them out because I'm not really looking and I don't even know if they come up on my screen, in fact. And, um, or there's a thing where you can click a hand and speak live, but you have to have headphones for that. You can't do that if you're just doing it over speakers because you get feedback and then it's horrible. Um, that sometimes works, it sometimes doesn't. It's the vagaries of this platform, which personally I think is absolutely rubbish, but there you go, it's the best one we've got at the moment. So, here we are, and what we're talking about today, um, where we're going to deploy our violet ray, in fact, is the whole concept of money. Now, with the city season, i.e. this, this uh, Christmas thing coming up, the reason that it has such a powerful sway on us, regardless of whether we believe in Father Christmas or Christmas or anything to do with all of that, predates all of um, the whole Christian thing anyway. It goes back to an ancient um, solstice festival. It's been going on for probably at least hundreds of thousands of years, where in the clans, uh, allegedly we'd meet from all over and have a proper blowout for five days, which started officially on the 21st, which is the solstice, and ended on Christmas Day, or actually Boxing Day, which would be the one the day after where they all dispersed, feeling a little worse for wear, presumably. And they would bring with them all the meats they had left from the summer hunt, um, which would by now would be probably starting to go off or whatever. I don't know what they do for the rest of the time until the weather started getting good again, maybe faster, I don't know. And they bring their magic mushrooms and their mead or whatever they used to drink, and they make merry. They light fires all over the place, which is where we get the tradition of lights or, or candles and Christmas trees and so on. 
apparently, in fact, they used to do it in the northern climes. They used to do it in the trees. They'd put fires in the trees or something like that, and that's where we get the Christmas lights from. I don't know. I can't really remember. I get confused with the details. But the reason that the draw is so strong to to come together with your family or to or with with friends or loved ones or to avoid it altogether, the reason that it's such an issue is because it's so deeply ingrained in our circuitry, way, way more than just in the last 2,000 years or so. And the tradition of bringing your meats and your bits and pieces to, to the, the festival, um, and you would presume that if you wanted to kind of make peace or do business with or kind of schmooze or, um, you know, kind of find women or men from other tr uh, clans to get off with or whatever it was you were, you were after, you would bring gifts and trinkets and all sorts of things. So that's where the tradition of feeling pressurized to spend more money than you've got on presents comes from. Of course, there are other issues like not wanting to look like a meanie, you know, wanting to have a staying good standing with everybody, not wanting to feel like you did, you know, reciprocity in others. You want to see to be seen to be doing the right thing because looking good is one of the main drivers in, in human society. And um, so there will be this innate pressure to go out and spend money that you haven't actually got um, uh, on presents that people probably might even most of the time want. Uh, in other words, completely wasting loads of money. And it's very interesting, isn't it? It's interesting what it does, the things it puts you through. I mean, most people do their present shopping as a sort of a chore. They get it over and done with as early as possible, as efficiently as possible. You know, I'll buy this one for Ronnie, I'll buy that one for Susan, I'll buy this thing for thing. All right, tick that off the list, tick that off the list. There's not a lot of magic in that, you must admit. It's a bit sort of sterile, as is the whole thing. As I say, the reason that we do it is compulsive because it's so deeply ingrained in the system. But it doesn't mean it's compulsory. This is where life starts getting interesting, when you realize there is an option and that you can exercise that option. Then life starts to become rather interesting because you deprogram yourself from the, the social trance. That as may be, we are talking about the flow of money. Now, money is um, something we've all made up. It's developed organically. It wasn't something that anybody contrived at any certain point in time, as far as I know. Although it must have been somebody's idea originally, um, as a as a medium through which we can exchange our services and our goods, our time and so on, our energy. Um, it was fine before when there was just a few people bartering their services and goods with each other. But once society grew, it became too complex. So you needed an IOU, you know, like if I'm going to take your wheat from you but, and I can't give you my cows yet because they haven't grown fully or whatever it is, um, I have to write a piece of paper that says IOU for all that um, corn and wheat or whatever. And that eventually developed into something a bit more sophisticated and now we have this huge lumbering system that um, keeps the world going and almost brought it to a halt and probably will again before long what we call the banking system, which, as you know, came from the be the, ba the benches, rather, banker, um, the bench in Venice, uh, where, where the money lenders used to sit, that used to finance the expeditions, like Columbus's expedition to America, which I guess was one of the more profitable of any maritime expeditions in history. Um, so money is essentially a symbol of energy when you boil it down. Now, energy flows in a current, just like electricity does, and hence why we call it currency. And it isn't a material um, phenomenon at all, in fact. It is completely imaginary. As we know, I mean, we found out that people are, I mean, I think the current level of money in the world has been worked out by Credit Suisse. I know this is a bit out of date. This is about a year old. Something like $215 trillion. Um, dollars. This is interesting. I don't know how they work that out, how, how much wealth there is in the world. The 90-something percent of that is owned by 66 people. That's also very, very interesting too. So that's how it all flows. 90% of this $215 trillion is actually owned by 66 people. Uh, this was I mean, it's probably out of date. I mean, these figures have changed in the last year, I'm sure. But that gives you a kind of a rough idea about how absurd the whole thing is. It's some bizarre game that very few people really understand. Um, but nonetheless, what this currency is, is a representation of qi, uh, how qi flows around. And um, qi is energy, as you know, it's an expression of the Tao in motion. So as soon as the Tao sets itself into manifest form, there is movement. This entire universe is moving. It's spinning. Every atom is spinning. Every planet is spinning. Every galaxy is spinning. The whole thing spins. Um, that, that is the mechanism that makes it be 
visible, I guess, makes it be material. Um, that spins is, is obviously crucial to the whole thing. In the same way, money spins as well. So if you, if you contemplate, um, well, let's go back over all the money that's ever been spent on your behalf by your parents, by the state, by any other medium you can think of, any other agent you can think of, and by you. And it would amount, if you calculated it carefully, to a minimum of a few hundred thousand a year. Um, and so therefore, it's up to quite a few million um, has been, uh, through your agency, has gone out into the, into the field, should we call it, this, this field of energy, the currency field. Now, if you, you can backdate um, your intention, because linear time is an illusion. It's a construct that we use for the sake of convenience. Uh, in fact, everything is happening in, uh, laterally, um, in a way, all at the same time. The reason we've constructed linear time is to stop it all happening at the same time and causing a big mess on the floor. So to give the reality some sense of rationale, to give this dream some, set, some sense of narrative, um, we uh, amazingly have constructed, without even realizing it, this illusion of linear time. The Aborigines, before they had came into contact with the, uh, the Anglo um, convicts and settlers, had no concept of linear time, as nor did the Native Americans before the Anglos and the Spanish arrived there. So it is actually a fairly modern construct, this, this, this notion of linear time. So you can backdate your intention, by which I mean, if you think of every penny that's gone out, the 100 million pennies or so that have gone out or more in your, in your name so far, and you bless every single one of those pennies in retrospect, you put in a, a, a seed of joyfulness inside each one. As it circulates in the big spin, it will attract naturally um, other pennies to it because everybody likes something we join inside of them. And eventually, all things come back around because the whole thing operates in circles. And all that money comes back to you just when you need it. This is all being well, of course, and this is if you are willing to subscribe to this model, then the DAO will operate by this for you. So whatever you spend comes back to you multiplied. Let's just start that off as your retirement plan, if you like. That's all going to happen at some amazing point that that energy is going to come back your way and you really just need to invite it and that's what we're going to be doing here. Now, contemplate your upcoming Xmas expenditure, whatever that's going to be. Um, because we're going to do the same magic with that. Whatever you, you spend out, if you do it with a good heart, with grace, injecting every penny with joy, uh, generosity of spirit, that penny will, after it's gone into the storeholders or the internet suppliers' hands, will go from there and out and about and go all the way around the world and whatever it does into the big spin and return to you multiplied. Um, even maybe by next Christmas, who knows. And the, um, this is just a game though, you've got to know that, this is just a game, because at the root of it all is the belief that the Tao will provide, no matter what, so there'll always be enough. That's a belief that if you cherish it and you project it, it will get mirrored back to you, and it works. I think everyone who has ever thrown themselves at the mercy of the Tao can attest to that. Um, but before we do that, it's really important to know that as much as it really looks like you really have to do it, you really don't have to do anything to please others that you don't feel like doing. Just let that sit in the silence there. You really don't have to do anything to please others that you don't feel like doing. And there'll be a part of your mind that will say, yes, but that's very selfish. Well, you could say that, or you could say it's very self-full. Um, my dead friend Frank, who was probably the wisest person I've ever encountered, um, was one of the most generous, loving people that I, I've ever known and he really loved his son, and he loved those close to him. He never bought his son a Christmas present or a birthday present, for example, just because he just didn't feel it. But he'd just suddenly give him the most amazing gifts out of the blue, uh, for no reason apparently whatsoever. And you get used to that. He was loved for being the most amazing character. Nobody ever castigated him for not buying presents for people. That was his reality. That worked for him. Most people are not that brave, including me. I mean, I succumb to this need to be a people pleaser to some extent myself, even now. So I do empathize with that, what he used to call this kind of bourgeois middle class urge to fit in. Um, however, it's good to know 
but you don't have to do anything to please other people that you don't feel like doing. You don't have to spend any money at all because you are loved for being you, not for being nice. This is really important. You are loved for being you. You are not loved for being nice. Nice is merely an act. It's a nice act, but it is just an act. Originally, nice meant the neatness of a knot, a sailor type. So it kind of just means fitting in, again, being neat in your behavior, which is fine. There's no criticism of that. Prefer it would be neat and all messy anyway, but not at the expense of authenticity, because this is what I teach. This is at the root of everything I teach, is just how to be you rather than pretending. Because when you're pretending, you're only having a pretending experience. When you're being you, you're having a real one, and that's what we're here for. Um, so it's good to um, honour how you may have limited yourself um, uh, because it creates a certain tension uh, and that tension has helped you feel alive. Um, it, it, at the same time, limiting yourself and fitting in and being conventional and, and, and adhering to the more race of society makes you feel safe as well because you're not challenging any of the the template of reality, you're kind of just not having to think about it too much, you're obeying, you're giving the power over your destiny if you like to others. What I'm going to suggest is to invite you to now, just for the time of the session, to be willing um, to feel the discomfort of no limits, no boundaries, um, just for a moment, to take yourself out of that comfy space and, and, and um, remove yourself from the mechanism that has you pleasing other people just for a moment, um, and if you see it that way, just for now, it will be so, something will shift, something profound will shift within you. And this isn't to promote being selfish or horrible, to the contrary. I mean, after being authentic, being you, the next thing is being kind, which means being aware of your kin, which is the entire human family, and empathizing. This is very important. We have to have this basic decency, which is what it comes down to. Um, so you are loved for being you, not for being nice. When you roll with the flow, i.e. following your chi, rather than trying to please or fit in, the flow will support you. When you're trying to fit in, um, there isn't much flow. You're not rolling with the flow then, you're jarring it. And the flow won't support you in this magical way at least. I mean, you'll be able to forge your path and you know, sort it all out quite lightly. But you won't be able to do it in this magical way where you throw yourself at the mercy of the doubt and let it support you. For that, you have to follow your chi rather than the, the need to fit in or be nice. Um, th this, uh, as I say, this, this almost instinctual need to spend and quite usually overspend um, it is partly then to uphold reciprocity, which is a beautiful thing. Reciprocity is one of the main mechanisms that hold society together. And there is a great dearth of an understanding or sensibility towards reciprocity. People are trying to rip each other off more and more as things get more and more competitive as the resources run out faster and faster. But therefore it's even more important to have the integrity to maintain reciprocity, uh, to be more mindful of being uh, reciprocal now. Um, but the driver for most of the spending, as I say, is really more to not piss people off. You might be offended not to receive a gift or to receive a substandard one or an inferior one in return for the one they, they've given you. Um, and as I say, partly because the Solstice Festival, into which Christmas was eventually uh, kind of shunted, um, is so ancient, it's almost biological. Um, that, that, that because they all have to bring whatever they have to the feast, that's what you feel you must do. But we are not ancient solstice festival goers anymore. Uh, most of us, as I say, are not even subscribers to the Coca-Cola version of Christmas, because you know that's where the modern Christmas comes from, don't you? The Father Christmas thing with the red and the, all the reindeers flying through the sky. That comes from Coca-Cola, ad in when was it, 1930 or something? Um, so think about that. We're really talking about Coca-Cola mass. Um, and some of us don't live in any myth at all, amazingly. Some of us have actually eschewed a whole level of myth altogether, other than perhaps the ancient, ancient, ancient ones. Um, so let us first divest ourselves of all the invisible strings uh, connecting us to myths of all sorts. Let's be that daring for the sake of this session. Um, and let us also divest ourselves of the entire drama of money or no money. 
being rich or being poor. Let's just let go of that whole story just for a moment. And let me explain something, the, the, the basis about how this meditation is, or the basis for this meditation. We create and sustain all myths in the forebrain, uh, the, 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 the prefrontal lobes. That's where all the, 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 the um, manufacturing and sustaining of myths occurs. It's in the forebrain. This is supported, it also triggers emotions in the upper belly area, the solar plexus. Um, the drama of feeling yourself in the world um, according to the myth you're subscribing to at the time, therefore goes on in the front of your body and the front of your head. Because the sense organs all face forwards, you perceive this drama, the drama of your life, which is actually something you're concocting in the forebrain, as going on out in front of you, uh, outside of you, in front of you, even though it's actually going on in your forebrain. And what that does is, it, because it's so compelling and riveting and fascinating, it draws you into the front of your body to get closer to it. However, if you learn to drop back inside the body, all the way into your back, the drama and all the energy associated with it drops away instantaneously. And um, then rather than be caught in the usual, what I call micro perspective, in which, um, say, not buying a gift if you were going for some Christmas do, uh, would seem like the biggest evil in the world, you know, some major tragedy. Um, rather than be lost in that whole conundrum, you, from the back of you, enjoy a macro perspective in which you see that it actually ultimately doesn't matter at all. And then you relax because you've got perspective. And when you relax, when you empty yourself of the drama, you create a space, a vacuum. And as the Tao say, when there's a vacuum inside of you, when you're empty, even gods and angels come to you bearing great gifts, let alone mere mortals bearing money. Uh, for one way or another, as you must have seen, it's via other people that money drops into your coffers. It doesn't just fall out through the sky. You might think, well, yeah, it comes through my internet screen somehow into my mysterious kind of um, invisible coffers um, as digital units. Um, but your internet screen and all the technology behind it and all the people pressing all the buttons is all about people. That's how it works. However, when you empty yourself of all of this, even gods and spirits, gods and angels come to you bearing great gifts, let alone mere mortals with money. So this is powerful. And if you're ready, let's begin. Um, close your eyes and allow all your energy to sink. All the energy in the brain, all the energy in the throat, all the energy in the chest, all the energy in the upper belly. Let it sink down into the lower abdominal area where it's held in the bowl that's created by your pelvic bones and your pelvic floor. So you're now sitting a bit like a weighted doll, one of those Daruma wobbly dolls. So if somebody pushed you over to the left, you just circle and swing back upright again. You're grounded, in other words, grounded in a fluid way. Then become aware of your spine, because your spine is the central strut of your whole physical presence. And rather than it being crumpled and, and compacted, Get a sense of it elongating like a snake being charmed out of its basket. Feel the crown of your head urge itself upwards towards the ceiling. I'm assuming that you're sitting or standing. Lying down is really not that great for meditation because it induces slothfulness. What we need to be is alert while we relax here. So you feel the crown of your head urging itself up towards the ceiling, which causes your chin to drop slightly towards your chest. And you'll notice that this has the effect of lengthening your spine. Not just at the back of the neck, though, all the way down to your coccyx at the tip of the spine, and from there all the way up to the crown of the head. You can now afford to drop your shoulders, and as you drop your shoulders, consciously feel that you are actually dropping the burden of the story you've been telling yourself, your life story. And all those thoughts and beliefs and opinions and prejudices, just drop them as you drop your shoulders. Let your shoulders broaden out. So you don't have to have them up around your ears anymore. Very subtly, without arching your back in the slightest, just lift your breastbone a fraction of a millimeter upwards and forwards a bit. And that opens the chest up and gives you a kingly or queenly air about you. It makes you regal and dignified. Dignified means literally upright. With the physical frame now subtly expanded, soften all the muscles, which are like the, the ropes of a, of a flagpole. 
if the flagpole is properly balanced on the ground, the ropes don't need to be nearly as tall to hold it vertical or perpendicular. So allow your muscles to soften from your face down through your neck, your throat, the back of your head, of course, your shoulders, down your arms, down your sides, down your chest, your belly, into your groin, through your back, down to your buttocks, through your pelvic floor, down through your legs, to your feet, to your toes. Every single part of you, where there is any soft tissue of any sort, just let it actually be soft tissue rather than rigid and, and calcified. You just give the command, soften up, soften up. Um, to aid this process along, stop holding your breath and allow the breathing to flow with regularity and evenness and smoothness, slowly and silently, and like silk being ripped from a cocoon. Valuing the breath as the elixir of life itself, not taking it for granted. Offering the out-breath as a sacrifice to the Tao and taking the in-breath in as a gift from the Tao, receiving it with full gratitude. This is life itself. And um, feel immediately as the breath has slowed down how your mind has slowed down. The worrying in the brain has slowed right down and become much quieter as the breath has become quieter. Now you have the, um, the big switch to make which is rather than be shoved up in the front of your body with all that noise and um, interference and static, allow yourself to drop back inside, behind the side seams, as it were, of your shirt, um, so that you're occupying the rear of you, everywhere rear of the side seams of your, what would be your t-shirt, your shirt, or whatever. Um, the back is solid, the back is strong, the back is silent. When you sit in your back, you become that. You become solid and, and strong and silent and no longer affected by the noise of the trauma going on in the front. You preside over it, you still command that space, but it is not commanding you. Now, from the back of you, it's clear that when you are in the front, that's all you have is the front, but when you're in the back, you've got the depth of you and you've got the front as well, but you're commanding what's going on in there. And um, <clears throat> the way to sit back is to visualize that your shoulder blades and the front of your spine and your rear, rear pelvic bones and your sacral bone comprise the back of the throne that, that you're sitting on is either queen or the king and you know how a queen or a king sits in the throne they don't lean forward they don't slouch they lean back uh, to maintain the, the, the status the power status but also originally it was because it was believed that queens and kings had uh, a divine, they were, it was the divine right of kings it was called, uh, where you served as a conduit for the, um, the divine here on earth. So to channel that, and hence why they wore a crown, because that was like the, 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 the inductor of the energy, um, you, you channel that divine energy through the crown of the head, down through the, the, the front of the spine, out through your hands as you bestowed your blessings or the opposite on your subject. Um, so let's just for this moment, be the queens and kings of no matter what, and channel the divine energy, if you want to call it that, the head and the energy, the mysterious power of the Tao, down and through the, the crown of the head, along the front of your spine, let it fill up everywhere in the front of your body, move everywhere through your body, so that the front arena, so to speak, rather than being concerned with drama and interference and static, is now just concerned with accommodating the, the flow of this heavenly energy is informing the, the drama space in the front now. And um, to um, get your mind to be fully quiet, if you visualize, now this is a separate kind of image, that the, the, the skull is like a cave in the mountains, high up, like a sacred cave, and it has a floor in it. And if you just very, very subtly, just not even a fraction of a millimeter, tilt your head back, and feel as if your mind is now being obliged to slide backwards along the floor into the back of the skull, where it rests up with its, rests up with its back against the rear wall of the skull, like it's leaning back into the rear wall of the cave. You'll notice there's a lovely pile of cushions being placed there for you. And as the mind sits there, it looks like a Buddha with your face on it, a wee little Buddha with your face on sitting in the back of the skull. Then forget about that and just get the sense of being in the back of the head and being in the back of the body. So we can drop all the visualization, drop all the flowery romance out of this now. Just be there. It's very simple. Just be in your back. It's your back. You be in it. And 
the front of you is through which you connect to what you're perceiving as the world in front. Rather than do this through the eyes and the mouth and the other sense organs, do it through your heart by visualizing now that the two halves of your breastplate are opening like a pair of mysterious sliding doors to reveal in the very core of your chest what you might want to see as a cluster of precious jewels, rubies and garnets, all amethyst and amber, the colors that would represent the heart, if you like. I'm not suggesting for a moment that there is a cluster of jewels there. It's just a way to focus the mind. Imagine them surrounded, bedecked with beautiful, otherworldly flowers emitting an incredible fragrance, unlike any the, anything you ever smelt on Earth. And at the same time, radiating a subtle, almost opaque, nonetheless discernible, rose gold light. I say opaque because it's not sensationalist. It's subtle. Subtle works better. And allow that to, to radiate from the center of your chest outwards to all your um, family members here in the circle and beyond to everybody here that everybody knows here rather and beyond to everybody that they know and so on and so on until all comers are bathed or touched by the subtlety of this um, rose gold light emitting from your heart. That's how you stay connected at a soul level and you have a much richer connection to all your fellows that way than when you do it through your talking and your thinking and your looking and all the rest of it. So be content being here, allowing your love to flow. Um, I'm going to now suggest, and again, this is merely for the purposes of visualization, that you see, sitting in front of you and a little bit elevated above you, um, a figure in lotus position, suspended somehow on what looks like a cloud made of pink, and the um, being is a holy being. And you can see it in whichever kind of idiom you like. It's a holy being, but this holy being is unusual um, in that it has your face. But it's not your face, that worried face. It's not your face, that concerned face. It's not that face that is involved in the drama of Earth at all. It's a face that has transcended all of that and that lives in the macro perspective. It's a face like the Buddha that's got infinite compassion and humor, the most beautiful smile gorgeous smile lines, and it's beaming at you. So this is your perfected self beaming slightly downwards at you, bathing you in its blessing, in its approval, in its love, in its acceptance. And your part now is merely to acquiesce to that. Acquiesce to that now. Allow that blessing to fill you. But do it from the back of you. Be in the back of you with your heart open and allow that blessing to fill you. Now visualize that the perfected being version of you is raising its right hand. Its left palm is facing downwards, the fingertips are facing down towards you, and the right palm, its fingertips are facing upwards and the palm is facing towards you. And it looks like, you can actually feel it, that this divine being is breathing in through its left hand, sucking that energy into its heart, and then multiplying that energy and sending it out through its right palm at you. And the way it's coming at you is in the form of a very concentrated, powerful violet ray. And it's not a garish violet. It's not like ultraviolet light. It's a much more subtle violet than that. It's got hints of gold in it and hints of emerald and hints of every color of the rainbow, in fact, um, enveloped in, in, in violet. And this is the agent that will alchemically produce quantum shifts in the warp and weft of your reality subsequent to this session. And firstly, you can feel the ray enter you um, through the top of your chest, a little bit above the opening that you created, um, into the thymus gland. And it's a subtly exhilarating sensation as it enters the body. This is to activa activate your um, access into a bigger dimension now. And having done that, become aware that you're sitting in the midst of a lateral field. Um, this field is symbolic or is representative of the field in which currency flows, in which money flows. So right now, as I said, there's something like somewhere over $200 trillion in this field, um, most of it in the hands of about 66 people. And you are merely about to invite uh, a humble, ungreedy, but ample measure of that to enter the field and circulate around you. 
bearing in mind that everyone in the circle is going to be doing exactly the same. So you're not being selfish here, you're just partaking of a group activity and it's not something that isn't yours. This is the money that is the money that's coming back your way anyway from all that was spent and all that you're about to spend. Um, that's gathered friends as it's been circulating and is now coming back your way as is your entitlement and um, your right to receive. And um, it, the, the money that's circulating, um, that, and it doesn't have to be named, it doesn't have to be even enumerated, you don't have to calculate how much it is, your subconscious knows how much you need already. And bear in mind that this isn't a one-off operation, this, this is continual, it can continue hereafter. So you don't have to be graspy with it. Um, the, the, this money is circulating in the distance at the moment. It's not totally visible. You can somehow discern its shadow as it moves around. You can feel it coming towards you in the distance. But first, the field has to be cleansed. And you can see the divine being, the holy being, with your face on it now. Raise both hands, so it must be quite serious, and angle them diagonally downwards into the field, as it were. And Notice this dual stream now of violet ray coming from the hands of your holy being down into the field that surrounds you so that the entire field very quickly turns pure violet. And this violet energy is causing a quantum shift so that money will not flow to you incrementally now, it will flow to you in an exponential way. There will be a quantum jump in the amount of money that comes your way now. And it will come exactly at the right moment. And Therefore, this is why it's important for us to be in a state of grace. So remain in the back, keep the heart open, no grasping, just observing with um, joyful anticipation. And um, the field is now being cleansed by quantum leap. So all the detritus of self-doubt and low self-esteem and lack of self-worth and all the rest that might block the um, inbound flow has been cleansed without you having to even think about it. And now, having cleansed it, if you look carefully and go to the horizon, you'll see a sort of spinning motion, like a big light spinning. It's a golden light, a very bright golden light. It looks almost like greyhounds running around a track in the distance. And as you focus on it, it comes closer, like the circle closes in. Before you know it, what you're actually looking at is what looks like a tidal wave of gold wealth, material wealth, money, um, surrounding you on all sides, coming closer and closer, to the point that it's actually a little bit scary, because it's so high, probably 300 meters high, this tidal wave, a proper tsunami of golden money energy, coming at you, not just from the front now, but coming at you from every single direction, 360 degrees. So you have to be ready to withstand the incoming force now, because this is going to hit you. It's going to be something quite visceral. This isn't that gentle, it's going to be strong now, because remember, it's a quantum leap. And this is building, and you can feel it, it's building and building, and it's getting stronger and stronger, and it seems to be coming faster and faster, threatening to completely engulf you. So prepare yourself now, empty yourself totally, sit right in your back, where you have invincible strength, and stability and nothing can throw you there. Let your front be completely empty so that there is no resistance, otherwise there is pain. So you have to be completely empty now, ready to receive this. And when you're ready, because you do have a part to play in it, give the command, which is, okay, come in. And as soon as you give the command, the wave now washes into you from every direction with full force and fills the space. It almost takes your breath away. But it's a beautiful feeling. It's a feeling of huge exhilaration. And it's filled with zillions of money. So see yourself receiving it now. Feel yourself receiving it. And feel yourself loving it. Love the feeling you're entitled to. Love the feeling of this money washing into your circuit now. And love the feeling of having an endless supply of it to do whatever you want with, whenever you want to do it, without limit. Feel your spirit rolling in it now. Feel your spirit swimming in it. And just keep dropping back inside and dropping the drama. And dropping the need for that stress that you were feeling to make you feel alive. Right now, be willing to feel 
even more alive by having no stress. And at the same time, because this is not just a selfish pursuit, see money in the same way flowing freely now for everyone on earth. See it flowing throughout the field, the collective field, for everyone. So this is not selfish. Be generous with your intention and see this golden energy flowing freely for everyone now because the more freely it flows for everyone, the happier everyone will be and therefore the happier everyone will be. And that's what we want because that makes us happy too. The flow needs to be everywhere to benefit everyone. So see it there, feel it there, feel it within you. And now all you have to do to make this magic real is with all your heart and soul and might say, I accept it. Say it three times. I accept it. I accept it. I accept it. Now, next week is the final session in this sequence and it's called the Deep Seasonal Fun Activator. It's a grumpy gift factor reductive process. So for any part of you that would play the grumpy gift in the face of the seasonal fun and frivolity, this is to divest you of that propensity and let you and get you set up to be a font of seasonal fun for yourself and everyone. I'm not talking about frivolous nonsense, I'm talking about the deep joy the fun of being alive in this magnificent theatre that we call life on earth. So in your own time, wriggle your fingers and wriggle your toes, wriggle your ears and wriggle your nose, open your eyelids, come back into the so-called everyday waking state and it's time to ask your questions. Don't be shy because I'm really in a question answering mood. Okay. Hello. Mm. Hi. Okay, Mark has a question, Stephen. I'm just opening up the line mm. to him now. Hi, Mark. Hi, Sue. Hi, Doc. Hey, Mark. Uh, my question is, uh, I have a friend who needs this money activator. What's the best way to help her get um, the money energy flowing towards her? Um, is she somebody that you uh, could talk to about all this, or is she somebody that you'd have to do magic for without her knowing? Yeah, I can talk to her about this, yeah. Because, I mean, it might be that you could um, explain to her what we did here, like describe that picture of there being a lateral field all around her. Um, yeah. and the, the money is just a symbol of energy. It's not a solid thing that we tend to think it is. It's an imaginary force that we've all created. So it's quite malleable. And mm -hmm. that you, you are going to act. You're going to tell her you're going to do some magic with her. And it's, it's just like play acting, because magic is play acting. And you're, you're going to yeah. direct a flow of wealth energy at her you can do it over the phone, you can do it in person or whatever, with your concentration. And you've got to tell her to go into the back of her body, open up her chest, and to be ready to receive. Then you tell her that you're transmitting a beam of violet light that contains within it a deep golden core, and that that's going to go bang into her chest. And when it does that, it's going to activate her wealth magnet. And then all she has to do then is to keep visualizing this golden light wrapped in violet inside her chest and money will start flowing her way in the next two or three days. And it will work. Funny enough, Mark, I just picked up a newspaper, a business page, this is one of the broadsheets. It's, I, it's right up here, it said, it's official, you really will be better off. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is, you know, you understand this magic, it's not, mm -hmm, not yeah. talking about... Um, absolute truth. There is none in this in this manifest world. If we see it one way, and we see it with enough clarity, and we have someone else as our witness when we're seeing it, um, we will manifest that. That's how the magic works. Yeah, that's tremendous. Thanks. I'll give that yeah. a bash with her. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. Bless you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Okay, Bernard uh, says, despite decades of spiritual practice, I have a strong resistance now to relaxation and going deep. How can I get past it? Bernard, that's a very, very good question. I, I mean, I think the way we describe ourselves is interesting because I bet you that there are moments when you don't have that strong resistance. It's there's something that's probably the most dramatic part of the, of the uh, spectrum. Uh, so it's the one that you're noticing more of the time. But there are bound to be cycles, and there are going to be moments where your resistance is not as um, great to feeling relaxed. And the probability is that at some point along the way, you got disappointed in 
in things not moving as you felt they should do, perhaps got angry with the whole notion of, um, should we call this this metaphysical uh, way of operating, and, and therefore went into resistance towards it. I do it myself. I think everybody does. And I think it's healthy to have an air of cynicism about anything that we do, because when we get too poke-based about anything, it just becomes well, it becomes creepy for a start. Um, and, and so really, I think what I'm saying is, honor that resistance, Bernard. It's good to see it and go, yeah, yeah, I want to be resistant. Don't think you're wrong to be resistant. And I want to be resistant because this makes me feel alive. And then while you're declaring that to yourself, so they're making it okay to be as you are, because it's silly to not be okay being as you are, drop back inside into the back part of you and notice that that whole setup of being in resistance to it is really just part of the description that you're, you've made. And that description and the whole story that surrounds it is occurring in the front of you. When you're in the back of you, you can observe that description of being in resistance to um, the relaxed state. And you can then make a choice. You can say, okay, well, I have all this, and I know how to do that, so I don't have to worry about losing that technique, that resisting technique. I also have the option of letting go and seeing how that feels. And I, I may well do that at some point. I might even take myself by surprise and just find myself doing it spontaneously. Well, I'm open to that as, as an experiment. Okay, fine. And that's all you really have to do. And then I think you'll find that your deeper self will provide instances of you feeling suddenly, spontaneously, really relaxed and thinking, hmm, this is nice. I mean, like, it happens to me a lot when I'm in a beta driving along because it's a very stressy island, even in the, well, especially in the deep countryside. There's an energy in the ground that just won't let you rest. It makes you create constantly. You've got to make music. You've got to write stuff. You've just got to do things. And it's stressy. Um, and everyone feels it. It's not peculiar to me. And there are moments when I'd be driving along or walking along and suddenly go, oh, man, I just feel so relaxed. Oh, that's nice. And, and I, I'm thinking about that, those spontaneous moments where you just suddenly stop and go, oh, oh it's beautiful being alive. And then if it's just for that long, and then you can go back into your stress again. That's thing, I think, is what I would suggest. Nothing too dramatic. It's little tiny openings into the realm of endorphins as opposed to cortisol stress hormone um, and see how that feels. The body will latch onto it fast is what I reckon. Joe says, uh, how do I stay strong when I feel scrutinized by the world for not being good enough? Joe, well, you just said it bang on. I mean, this is the problem that is affecting everybody, and especially the young generation. Um, how do you stay strong when you feel that you're being scrutinized um, somehow because you're not good enough, i.e. you're not looking good enough, you're not looking like you're performing well enough, you're, you're not looking like you're up to it properly? Firstly, bear in mind that everybody is feeling that stress. The more narcissistic our society becomes, the greater the pressure to look great becomes. The more airbrushed everybody looks, in other words, the more perfect everybody's trying to be. Um, the, the, the more the pressure becomes, uh, the more camera lenses that are focused on us and you know, surveillance uh, methods that are directed at us, the more we unconsciously, if nothing else, feel that we are being scrutinized. And the fact is, is that the, the area of reality where that scrutiny is occurring or the perception of it is occurring and where the sense of needing to uh, live up to a certain standard, where all of that conundrum is occurring, that is in the front of the body. It's a constructed, confetted piece of theatre um, that we collectively collude in, um, upholding, but is in fact nothing more than an illusion. When you drop back into the back of you, it's clear to see that, that all of that is just a game, that you're free to play or not play as you wish. Rather than trying to resolve it in the front and thinking, I don't have to be looking good, I can be myself and all that stuff, just be yourself by dropping back inside and then you notice immediately that all that stuff isn't real. Then interestingly, you start to perform a lot better because you're coming from the depth of your power and then you look better and then you stop worrying about being scrutinized because you're doing it like you feel like you could be doing it as you start reaching your potential. This is um, a technique, this, this backdrop is a technique that comes from the martial arts. When you are in your back when you're in a fight, you punch or kick or block or whatever you do from your back. Yeah, it's got your whole body weight behind it, so it has a hell of a lot more power, as well as which you stop being scared when you're in your back because you, you're still and silent in there. You're not associated with all the noise of the front. 
And um, the, 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 the interesting thing is, is that when you go into your back in a contest or a fight or whatever, you perform 10 times better. You know, you, you really, that's when the magic takes over and all the training kicks in and you're able to perform your moves like a proper master. And the same goes for any activity in life and in general. The more you sit in your back with an open heart, carrying the intention to perform to your full potential at all times, that's what you'll get. So really, that's the answer. Be in your back and it, all the rest will follow. Okay. I've got a couple more questions in. Just bear with me um, because Claire has okay. added some additional information to hers. So I'm um, just reading this through as it's come in. Uh, Claire says, mm. thank you, Barefoot Doctor. Great satsang. I feel its power. I'm feeling extremely emotional constantly at the moment. Not sure which way to turn in my life. It feels very confusing with all areas of life feeling like a massive struggle. I strongly feel that if you change the inside, i.e. working through your problems, blocks, demons, etc., and really having worked on forgiveness where necessary, I'm angry at why I still feel my life is still just an existence rather rather than alive. I feel like I've tried for over 10 years and I'm still not getting anywhere fast from a rather frustrated Claire. Um, dear Claire B, <laughs> um, yes, I hear you. I totally hear you. First of all, this sense of frazzledness, this feeling of frustration and irritation and resentment for life not being uh, playing ball, as it were, um, is really common at the moment. And it, the, the tensions are high. We have to acknowledge that. Um, it's meant to be like that. The theatre of life at the moment is such that the tensions are high in the world in general. And um, it's scary. You know, we can't rely on the future. Um, nothing is as it was before. It's all changing very quickly. Nothing is stable or reliable. So it creates an existential insecurity. Meanwhile, in the midst of this angst-ridden state, we're taking on these deep, ancient metaphysical methods for attaining the enlightened state in the midst of it all, of which we get glimpses, um, but even with lots of practice on a daily basis, um, oftentimes that's all it is, it's just glimpses, because the power of the illusion of the external world is so strong, especially because it's so uh, intense and intensifying more all the time. Just bear in mind that we all chose to be incarnated here at this point, to enjoy this show, so let's not feel sorry for ourselves about any of it. It's meant to be as it is. Um, the, um, th this feeling of frustration, I have found in my experience in myself and in working with people, is exactly what happens just before you're about to burst through the barrier that's holding you uh, separate from the state of peace you're after. And what's interesting is that the shift that gets you to it is really subtle and discreet rather than huge and spectacular. And it's like a, a matter of degrees rather than miles, as it were. And the way is, uh, for fear of being repetitious, um, but it is important, to drop into the back as often as you can. When you do this, don't expect anything spectacular. It's a very subtle little maneuver. When you're in your back, it, I, I had it this week, I was in a state of, um, last week rather, in a state of heightened arousal, should we call it, um, for having been beset by a million details needing sorting and things not moving in a smooth way and um, you know the, the, the opportunity for being irritated coming up at every single second. And um, there was a point where it got so intense that I remember, this is bearing in mind, I'm teaching this stuff and writing about it and thinking about it all the time. I remember thinking, you've just got to drop into your back and drop the whole drama from it. And it was like, what do you mean drop into my back? I thought, wow, you've really come far into the nonsense here. And then I let go and I dropped into my back and it was nothing. And I remember hearing myself saying, as I say it to you, it's nothing, it's no big deal, I'm just in my back now. But I noticed within seconds the whole thing fell away, all that frazzle fell away. All the, the fear, the anxiety and all the rest of it, the frustration just seemed to drop away. There was an echo of it, it sort of kind of echoed at me a bit. And then I noticed within a day of that, I had that beautiful, light, joyful, relaxed feeling, that feeling that it's fine, everything's going to be fine, relax, it's cool. So you know, you know the feeling we all want, that's what you're after, isn't it? That thing where it's going to be fine, it's all fine, don't worry about anything. And you only get that when you come into your back. And you don't have to be there when you even. You just come in and out of it, but as long as you come into it, that's the key. And I promise you, with all my heart, that if you focus on that just for a few days, this gift that has been eluding you will be yours before you know it. And it will become in the most gorgeous, beautiful way that all you'll be able to do is acquiesce to it and say, thank you. And, but for now, 
hear what I say. I'm not asking you to believe it. Just take it in. Whatever there is there that resonates, let it resonate. And just say to yourself, I accept it. I accept it. I accept this gift. I accept it. And then let me know what happens in a week or so. Um, I'm scared of being lonely over the Christmas season after recently ending a relationship. Any tips? Yes. Ah, oh, Claire P, you're scared of being lonely at the Christmas time because you've just ended a relationship. Well, well done for having the courage because, as you know, and you might have well been able yourself, most people don't end relationships before Christmas, do they? They always wait till after New Year to avoid that very thing. Um, the thing is um, that we are all, and this is not just theoretical, we are all connected to the continuum, the continuum of consciousness and love. That's what we're searching for when we seek solace in other people's company. We're not really wanting to get away from our real selves. We're trying to get away from the noise of our front self, this drama that we created in the front of our bodies, because it's unpleasant. And we want to escape it, so we hang out with other people, because it, it somehow cancels it out for a little while. Not long, usually. It returns, and then it multiplies, because we both start talking about our dramas. But that's what we're trying to get away from. Now, when you sink into the back part of you with an open heart and just attune your awareness to the infinite presence that informs and connects and animates everything and everyone throughout time and space, there's a sense of that it is impossible to be lonely. You are one with it. Now, the front part feels awkward because it's not doing what everybody else is doing. You feel like a loser. You know, what's wrong with me? Why am I somebody you've got nobody to hang out with on the solstice, which is what we're really talking about, where people have come together for probably millions of years um, in the same way, and I'm some kind of lemon that can't get that one going. I must be in, in deficit in some way. But to the contrary, you are instead choose to be a woman of power, and you are holding that power strongly from the back of you, connected to all that is, impossible to be alone and impossible to be lonely. And then you transmit your love to everyone in the world um, as a gift to them. By doing that, it cancels out all sense of alienation and isolation. You might have to do it once every 10 minutes, um, a few times, before the feeling subsides. And what you'll find is there'll be somebody will phone you or come around and see you or invite you somewhere, just when you weren't expecting it. And you will feel you will be blessed. You will have your gift of companionship. Um, whether it happens in, in, in the flesh or it, or it happens just in your spirit, there will be the sense of being companioned, not just by one, but by everybody in a way. And when you cast your love out to the world as a gift, what you'll notice as well is that all the people that you feel that you should be like, who've got all their people to hang out with, most of them are suffering a lot and are finding the whole thing rather awkward. So really you're in a beautiful position that you don't have to deal with all that stuff. And again, it comes back to your friendship with Big Claire P, with the big Dow of Claire. That's the real relationship here. And I know it's scary, of course it's scary. Everybody has that fear, of course they do. The day will pass, it's only a day. And it will pass and you'll come out the other end of it feeling elated one way or the other. That is my prediction for you. I'd like you to let me know what happens. Right, well, we have a Caroline has a hand raised, and we have two more yes. questions, Stephen, after that, uh, if okay. you're okay for time. I am. I love these questions. Alrighty, so I'm going to unmute you now, Caroline. Hello? Hello, Caroline. Hello, how are you? Oh, very well. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Nice to hear your voice. What can I do yes, for you? Yes, nice to be here. Right, I loved what you said earlier about um, your love for being you and not for being nice. Mm. Um, because the situation that I'm in at the moment, I have yeah. to tell my friend that I'm living with mm. that I found a more perfect place to live and I'm really worried about upsetting her. Mm. So I just want to thank you for saying that earlier because that's helped me to put things in perspective. Mm. And um, yeah, I just want to share that really. I think, I think um, when these things are done from a state of love, it doesn't mean you can have a blowout with someone you love and it'll be all right. Yeah, we forgive each other. It's okay. It's all part of the theatre. And you have to remember that they've manifested it from their end just as much as you have from yours. And it's okay. You probably won't hurt their feelings at all. It will actually be really, really fine. I think you might be surprised how easy it will be. Okay. That's my cool. hope. I wish you a Merry Christmas. And, a new and you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, bless you. All right. Uh, we just have a comment 
that's also from Gabby on the same theme. Uh, she says, thank you for the clear point about not ple people pleasing this season. I've been working with exactly this these last few days. That is accepting cleanly that someone I hoped so much was going to come over for Christmas will not be coming as I hoped, as they really need to spend some time on their own healing and do that in solitude at this time. I have the greatest respect for this and hope others understand, but still found it a little difficult to accept for a short time. The wonderful thing yeah. suddenly dropped in, and that it is that we have been talking about how important it is to do what we need to do, and it makes me really happy they are able to do this and be so honest with me. Thank you as always so much. Bless you. And bless you too, Gabby. And I think it's really, again, it's about being in the back with the heart open. Then whatever we're going through, we hold the other that we're dealing with in a state of that love. And it's not an intellectual abstraction. It's a, a sensation of the energy emitting from the hearts, enveloping them. And then it will resolve. Everything will resolve in a, in a healthy way for everyone. Everyone. Okay, we're over to Jen now. Uh, Jen says, hi, Doc. I have a very materially obsessive family. Um, is dropping back and radiating from the heart while in that environment the best way to passively transform the situation without engaging directly, which inevitably, well, the last few Christmas days, results in conflict? Yeah, I'd say so. And I'd say maybe to actually drop the idea of transforming the situation. There's something kind of a weird paradox with doing this kind of magic. There has to be some sense that it's okay as it is. We have to kind of love it as it's presenting itself now so that by dropping back and opening the heart the intention is for the, the situation to transform into one where everybody feels perfectly nurtured by it goodness knows how that happens but it it can happen um, and then to somehow love it as it is so we take it on as this is the mission now to really be in this as it is not trying to change it let me be in this milieu of everybody being obsessed with things and not try to change it, but love them for being as they are with that. Don't try and change it. Love them for being that. I'm not that. I stay in my, in my center with my heart open. And I find that usually by playing that role the, as an agent in the alchemical mix, it's a much quicker way of the situation, paradoxically, of it transforming. So we don't try and transform the situation. That, that sets up a kind of a goal and then a potential failure. Instead, we love the situation as it is. We see that this is the Tao, God, the Buddha, whatever, playing a role of people being materialistically orientated in an irritating way and love it for that interesting bit of theatre. Hey, and you come into the back of you with the heart open and you appreciate this act of the Tao and for what it is. Meantime, holding an intention for the very best to evolve for everyone present, somehow or other magically, mysteriously, causing a transformation without you needing a transformation, and then one will happen. Uh, that isn't too confusing. Um, and I wish you a Merry Christmas. This is the last one uh, from Geraldine. Hi guys, I know the recurring fear of serious lack, not surviving, is a big block to the flow of abundance, safety, security. When I think I've got past it, it arises again. Any suggestions? Well, how about this, Geraldine? It just occurs to me. We assume that, okay, that we're assuming that, um, that if we have a block, oh, sorry, that if we go into anxiety about survival, and I know because I get tempted that way constantly, um, that, 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 and it really feels real, doesn't it? It's like, oh, it's all going to go wrong, oh, shit, oh, I've done it all wrong, and this is it, it's just the downward spiral now to the end, and oh, I blew it, didn't I? Jesus, and all the stuff I know, and I still didn't get it right, and all of that stuff that we can get into. And think to ourselves, well, right, that's blocking it, isn't it? Every time I do that, it's going to block the flow, so that's why it's all messing up. How about let's assume you know that when I do that, actually, strangely enough, that's going to work as the mechanism that's going to increase the flow. How about that? Because there's no rules. You understand that. It's how we project it. It's how it will be reflected back at us. So let's imagine now that every time you or I get stressed out about not having enough money, every time we go into a whole horror movie about what's going to happen if we don't have any money, let's imagine that, weirdly enough, that's the thing that's going to make the money flow. It's not an intellectual connection. It's something even weirder than that. That's what's going to make it work. So you can just tell yourself that. It's okay for me to get stressed out and anxious about money because that actually is going to make it come faster, weirdly enough, at this point in time. Try that as a magic trick. I believe you'll find it will work. Anyway, there's nothing going to stop the power of this, what we've done today. It was really strong. 
and it's going to be lovely watching it wash in for all of us. Really, I want to hear from you. Come next week, and let's talk about it at the end of the next session. The deep seasonal fun activator. It's going to be fun, everybody. Grumpy get factor reductive process. I know I need that because I really get to be grumpy get a lot of the time. It's going to be fun. Let's, let's do it. It's been beautiful having you here. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, everybody. And see you next week. Pip it for now. Thank <laughs> you.